morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody. This is uh, such a cool thing to be a part of because uh, this the past couple of weeks, just thinking about, hard to believe that I've been here with you guys seven years now, but you have this 25 years of the church family being in existence, but it goes back even farther than that. And what I love is when we read through scripture over and over again, we read about the people of God coming together to take time to remember, to take time to reflect on the goodness of God. And I love that they did that thousands and thousands of years ago, and I love the fact that we're going to do that today, that we're going to take some time to remember about how big, how awesome, and how great our God is. And I know a number of you are newer, especially the last few years, uh, and there's going to be so many stories. I know as we were going through pictures, uh, there were so many stories I had never even heard of. Most of these pictures had never seen before, so it was so much fun to to uh, talk with Reed and to hear these stories, and I know you're going to be blessed, and I hope that you leave this morning knowing that you are now a part of this story. This is all of our stories. Maybe you're just getting into this in the last six months or less, or maybe you've been here the whole time throughout this, but whatever it is, wherever you're at in that journey, in that time frame with that, I hope that you leave knowing that you are part of something very, very special that God has been doing and continues to do and will continue to do. So uh, obviously with 25 years of history and everything, I had to have the master storyteller of (laughs) our church history uh, up here with us. So you guys show a little love for Reed Jude up here with me. (laughs) So you just picked the oldest guy in the church. (laughs) Well, I was a little worried because I know how Reed gets nervous in front of groups. So... uh, (laughs) A little worried about having him up here. I didn't know if we needed to bring Sue up for some moral support there or so. But, um, so, Reed, this is quite the story, and it, it goes back beyond the 25 years of being a officially a recognized church family. Give us a little bit of insight into why. why, why are, how are we here today? Why are we here today? What, what got this going? Yeah, first I want to say that, you know, if you heard all my stories, we'd be here for a week, but... Um, we're going to try to get through 20 years and 25 minutes or something. But, uh, but it started, um, actually started at the New Paris Church of the Brethren, uh, which is just down the road a few miles in the little burg of New Paris. And um, I was actually, well, Sue and I, after we got married, had attended there for nearly 20 years. I think we were there 19 years. Uh, and we were very much in uh, what was going on there at that church. I was a member of the board and, you know, in the choir. And Sue was, she had all kinds of things she did. And we were just entrenched. Uh, just, we're 25 years. It just so happens that this month, New Paris Church of Brethren is celebrating their 100th year. And my dad has been a part of that church for 91 of those 100 years. So, um, so that, that comes a little bit later, but you might, even from just that statement, and I've still got five or six aunts and uncles that go there, um, the Jude family is pretty entrenched in this church. So when we decided to leave, it was a pretty big deal, uh, we might say. So, but anyway, that's another story for another time. Um, but on the board, I was there, and I, and I was part of the team that hired a young man to be our assistant pastor, and his name was Mike Overpeck, and he had a young family. And... Um, we had a former pastor named Earl Hostetter, and Earl was no longer our pastor. He had, he had retired, but he had gone to Elgin, Illinois. Um, the Church of the Brethren has a, has a national office in Elgin, Illinois, and they asked him to come for a couple months and um, just do an interim deal there at the, at the, at the uh, National Brotherhood. So he did, and one Saturday night, he ventured out. He was there kind of by himself. His wife wasn't with him. He ventured out, and he decided to go to this newfangled church called Willow Creek. And he went to Willow Creek up in Barrington, Illinois. And I I might say this guy was probably 75, 76 years old and uh, was blown away and could not believe what he was seeing. He was seeing music and drama and this place just filled up. And Willow Creek was only a few years old at that point. And so he came back and had a meeting with Mike and said, I saw something that I think may be the future of church if we want to reach people for Jesus Christ. And so... uh, so he, he talked Mike into going up with him. They took a look at it. And um, Mike got all fired up about it. And um, oh, what, what I, sh- I want to I re- go back just a minute. Before that happened, actually, I believe it was before that happened, the church did a live nativity at, 
at uh, Christmas one time, and we had, you know, Mike did that, and we had, we had people outside, and people could walk through, and they could see the nativity and everything, and Mike just happened to be out around there when this little boy came through, and I, I can't remember if it was his family or not, but a little boy came through, and he was walking and looking at this and, like, questioning, like, what's this, what's this, what's this, and Mike talked to him, and this little guy had no idea who the baby Jesus was. No idea. And that, that got Mike in the heart. He's like, we have to do something about this. I mean, we can't be in the middle of the Bible belt, you know, and have a little guy not know who Jesus is, especially baby Jesus, you know. So, so anyway, that was percolating in Mike. And then Earl came and he said, okay, we've got this going on. And so he went, he came back and he was fired up and he talked to Sue and I and, uh, we, just, we started talking this over and deciding this is something that we really need to think about because um, Willow Creek was basically designed to be built for a church for unchurched people. It's, it was designed for people who just didn't go to church, didn't really want to go to church, didn't, maybe it had a bad experience. You know, maybe they grew up in church kind of and then had a bad experience and didn't really like it. And you know, when, they, when mom told them they didn't have to go anymore, they just never went anymore. You know? Or it could be... Uh, just never had that experience. You was in a family that's never had that experience of knowing Christ. And so uh, kind of like, I guess I would, I would liken that a little bit to the mission field where, you know, there's a lot of churches that send people overseas to missions. Well, when people, when we send a missionary to Africa or, you know, or wherever it might be, they don't walk in there with a three-piece suit and speak English and sing, you know, American hymns. They have to relate to the culture. You know, in order to be able to reach people for Christ in another culture, they have to relate to the culture. Well, that was kind of part of what Willow Creek's theme was, is that we relate to the culture. And so if we want to reach, if we want to reach the people in our families that don't, that don't know Christ, we want to reach the people in our jobs, you know, in the office, you know, on, in the, on the line, you know, the cashier uh, at McDonald's, I mean, whoever it might be, somebody that you know, generally somebody that you know, if you want to reach them for Christ, and the only way you've got to do that is to try to talk them into coming to your church where you have to wear a coat and tie, which back 25 years ago we did, and um, listen to Aunt Ethel singing way off tune in the choir <laughs> and, uh, and, and being, being basically expected to do this and do that, you know, like, well, we, you know, oh, you come here now, we expect you to lead the junior high boys um, or whatever the case may be. You know, we, we came to the realization that there are a lot of people that we love and know and would like to have reach Christ that will never enter a traditional church. There's nothing wrong with traditional church. Don't get me wrong. That's great. But there are people who would never enter a traditional church. So we decided maybe this is something we ought to try to do. And, uh, and we got together with a few other couples, and, and it was a very, very small core group, and we decided we're going to try this new way of doing church. And so um, we started very, very slow. We had a couple months of trying to put together, you know, numbers, put together ideas, those kinds of things. But uh, this is the first sign that we built. Uh, we procured the auditorium at Bethany Christian High School. Um, and we had nothing to our names. And they didn't trust us. Um, <laughs> Because, uh, I mean, it's just this bunch of weird people that want to come in here and do a different kind of church. You know, like, okay, that sounds kind of weird. Um, and it was called a seeker church because we want to have people, we want to we relate to people who are seeking Christ. So we called it a seeky, seeker church. They thought it was a secret church. And so um, <laughs> they thought that was weird. And so, uh, so basically, we built this sign. Well, then this is the interest going in there. But we built the sign, and everything we did had to be brought out every Sunday. Well, actually, we started on Saturday nights. We started on Saturday nights, and we had to pull the sign out in front of the school and let it sit there, and then when our service was over, we had to get it back out of there, haul it away. Uh, for all of our services and everything, we had to do, it was, yeah, this, and we had to, that sign had to be hung. That sign had to be hung. Everybody, we had to go in and hang the signs then take them down and take them with us when we left. Um, and then we had, uh, on, the, on the stage, they didn't really want us to use their lights or anything, uh, we had to put our own sound system in, uh, so we would bless the, uh, the, the tech guys. We had to come in and do, um, they usually came in about 5 or 5.30 in the morning, or if it, was, if it was on a Saturday when we first started, they'd come about noon and start 
You know, all the stuff you see up here, they basically had to put all that up every week. And then not, not only that, but the, but the snake, what we call the snake or the cords that, run, that runs all this stuff had to be drug all the way up to the top of the auditorium and all that had to be set up. And it took hours and hours to set up. And then as soon as we got done, tear it all back down, load it on a truck, take it to storage, because they wouldn't let us give us any storage or anything. So, I mean, the, the amount of time and effort that went into doing a service was pretty incredible, really. And people just hung with it, kept doing it week after week after week because it's important. We need to reach people for Christ. And who is going to do it if we don't? Because it's not working through the traditional way. So anyway, that's one of our signs. And then you get started. They did have a grand piano they let us play. And Nancy, who's on the keys this morning, uh, played it. That for, in that fact, that's Nancy right there. And so uh, they, they did let us do that. And there's, uh, there's I think, actually the the first service, um, and actually, uh, you know, it's, there's kind of foggy, I can't see, but uh, Don Reynolds and Steve Martin were, were part of it. I think Neil's up there actually singing, and me and my wife in the yellow, and... Uh, Looking good, Sue. Looking good. I think, good. I think uh, uh, Tara uh, was in there, too, and um, anyway, you see nothing's on stage. Oh, there, you, you see Neil a little bit better, but nothing's on stage, and uh, there are no decorations, no anything, and so... That was, that was uh, what we started with and did our best with it. Um, I might have mentioned, okay, this, yeah, let, me, let me back up just a little bit. So part of the deal was, part of the deal was is that if you're gonna, if you're gonna to represent the culture, you know, you don't wanna wear the three-piece suit, you know, and the tie, you don't wanna, you know. So, so basically, we, I mean, we wore jeans and Hawaiian shirts and uh, I let my hair grow, uh, which probably there'll be a few pictures that'll show That's I had great big old long mullet. And, uh, and, and uh, yeah, and I, didn't, I, I want nobody making fun of me for that. Well, okay, you probably will anyway. Uh, but, uh, but there was something in Mike that just wouldn't let that happen. You saw he showed up, you know, looking kind of skinny and young, but uh, he still had the tie on. We were like, dude, you got to lose the tie. Um, so he, he did eventually, but, uh, but that was Mike. Uh, and then here's another shot. Again, we had the... Uh, um, I don't remember what we called the girls or the evangelettes, I think, or something. Um, <laughs> the, Sue and the evangelettes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sue? yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so anyway, that's, uh, I think that's Jim up there in the drums. I know there's a couple pictures, but Jim Lance is here this morning, and, uh, world's greatest drummer, and, uh, and, and he was up there too. But now you see here, they, well, actually not much. They let us actually put a potted plant out, you know. Uh, and we had that screen back there. But anything you see up there, we had to, we had to remove at the end of, of the service. So, uh, so we started per, kind of, and, and Awesome God, which we did this morning, was one, one of the first songs we ever did on, uh, in the early days. Uh, and then, oh, now you see a little bit of the mullet there on me. Um, now, here, here's, here's a deal where, this is kind of interesting. This was a little bit longer, because, you know, we actually had a couple banners up and stuff we had to take down. But, um, but... Neil, you must not have been there that morning because you notice up in the corner up here uh, is Sue, my wife Sue, playing bass on a keyboard. She just playing the bass notes on a keyboard because we didn't have a bass player that morning. But, uh, but <laughs> Sue do it, just do, went under her chair. Do it, doing, what, <laughs> doing whatever it takes, you know, basically doing whatever it takes. But that was some of those early services. And you can see we actually got three, three plants out there, three fake plants out there now. So they started to loosen up with us a little bit. And trust us, because we were there. Um, I mean, altogether, we were at Bethany for 14 years. So as we went through the years, they started to like, okay, these guys aren't as weird as you might think. There's Larry, uh, Larry Kripe, and, and this, is, this is what happened every morning. And this was, no, this was every, this, for 14 years, these guys had to set everything up, get in at 5.30 in the morning, set everything up, and then, and then there's Justin, those guys are both still with us, and, and he's setting up all, you know, he had to come up and set everything up. All those wires had to go in, everything had to be set up, up in, up in the loft up there, and then it had to be all torn down and all taken down um, when we were done. So, uh, huge, and, and here's loading things up and having to haul it to storage and every, every Sunday. Everything had to be taken completely out of the, out of the building and hauled away. And, and for those of you that have been here, there's Tom. Tom, the, uh, the, the sound guy that was... Uh, Irritating to us all, um, but he was a good hey, guy. Uh, your mic's still on. Uh, your mic's still on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, did I say that out you loud? You said that out loud. Oh. Uh, just FYI, okay. Tom was a good guy, and he was very dedicated. And sometimes I just had to 
ramp him down a little bit. Um, but anyway, he was, he was there helping too. He was there at five in the morning with everybody else and, and setting things up. So, so anyway, that was kind of our life at that point. So you guys had a place to start doing worship together as a church family, but you needed some offices as well. That's right. <laughs> kind of hard to have a place where it's temporary and you have to be in and out and you don't have any place for the pastor to be, for Sue to be, as she programmed, those kinds of things. So we had to move on to the, oh, and there's Mike and Tara right there. We just kind of stuck it in there. I will, I will say, I, I want to yeah, interject something here. At the very beginning, well, in and uh, Krista didn't even know this, but at the very beginning, there were actually three pastors involved. Mike was kind of the lead pastor, but there was two other pastors, Tim Bartholomew and Ken Swank, and they came on board and helped Mike and, and uh, were you know, fairly deep into it, and it's helping to get this thing started and rolling. Tim eventually then moved to Montana, so it was hard for him to commute, and, uh, and Ken, uh, you know, Ken moved on too. But, uh, so then at that point, Mike and Tara decided that they were going to um, do this for real. And see, for a while, when we very first started, we were doing Saturday nights, and then he was still the assistant pastor at New Paris, and then, um, and then we'd do Sunday morning. And, we, and if he was on a Sunday morning, you know, if he would maybe had the message or something, he'd do Saturday night, then he'd do Sunday morning with a different message, because obviously it was traditional church. And so we did that for about six months and decided that it was um, not really working. I mean, of course, now Willow Creek did a Saturday night, and then they did a Sunday morning, and they, they had multiple services. But we started out on Saturday night thinking oh, that'd be a cool place for people to come and have a place to go on Saturday night. And we realized that people generally opted for the basketball games or the bar or someplace like that on Saturday nights and not church. And so, uh, so after six months of uh, really giving it a good shot, we decided the only way we're going to make this work and really reach people is to go to when people would... You know, even though it's a different kind of a church, it's still a Sunday morning where people would have more of an apt an, an attitude of maybe being able to get up by 10.30 and come to church. So at that point, you know, Mike was still getting a salary from New Paris, and they were kind of on board with, ah, oh, this is cool, we're going to plant this church and everything. And, and uh, I mean, they were really supporting it, but they were planning it. Well, Mike and Tara um, decided at that point that they were going to um, go for it. And I will always admire them because they have three young children, and they went for it. Uh, they did, we just started the church. He, he resigned from New Paris, and we started the church, and he was just going on the faith of God and nothing else because he had no idea how he was going to support his family or everything. And uh, so give them multiple credits for that because they, they, they did it, and, and we went along, but, you know, the rest of us at least had jobs. So um, we, had to, we had to try to help, help support all we could, but they, they did do that. So um, we will love them forever. Uh, but then we started, we had to have a place for them to be, and so uh, right next to Goshen Family Restaurant, Joanna's that you know in Waterford, there is, I think, I don't know if it's an insurance company or something, but um, behind it was an old body shop, and it was a body shop. I mean, it was all painted, the you know, floors were all painted, it was a nasty garage is what it was, and we had no money, and so we were able to rent that, I don't remember how much, but probably for not very much, we rented it, and then we went ahead inside and redid, basically. We put the paneling up. We, we built a couple offices in there. Um, there's Mike's office, I think it was, that we built in there. And, of course, everything was there. We had the offices. We had the band rehearsed there. Um, there was meetings there. There was real, actually a little grungy, nasty basement in there, and that's where we had the youth group. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the youth... I was, I was in charge of the youth at the time, and, you know, it, but the, the kids loved it. You know, it's a, it was their own place. You know, it was their place to go and be out, uh, be out of the way, and, and uh, so it was fun. But that was called the Networks Building, and we did that for a number of years, and then we were able to, and this, is, this is, looks really nice, then there's, a, there's this old church, or this built, uh, house right next to Bethany Christian, and they bought it and gave us the opportunity to take that as our office, and that's the story that Dar had shared with us that we were thinking we were going to buy a house down on, in Violet Road, down by the cemetery and, uh, in Waterford, and they, uh, that just wasn't coming through, and then we had this opportunity, and we took that opportunity, and lo and behold, once we cleared it out, because this is, this is actually today, this is what it looks like today, when we bought it, you couldn't even tell there was a house back there. It was so overgrown that there, Justin just said this morning, you know, when he said we're going to take that house next to the school, he's like, what house next to the school? There is no house there. It was com 
you couldn't even see it back there. So we had to go in and clean all that up and, and, uh, and work through it and get it to where we could actually use it and see it. But we got in there and found it and said, the Violet House. So, uh, so we did. God did. That God was faithful. And Mike had always thought that he would, uh, that's what he would need. And, and uh, um, we did. So this is kind of what the interior looked like. Um, and throughout the whole house, it was just all kind of nasty and, and broken and this is a before and after of the same room. So this right? is the this same is room, yeah. So we did this, coming. and then we changed it into that. Um, that was Sue's office. That was, that was still the furniture she had here in her office here. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's a theme that will be throughout the, the, uh, the whole history of the church as people came together and did whatever it takes to make things work. Uh, the amount of hours and time that people, that people have spent at this church in the last 25 years in volunteer service is incredible, incredible. And you can see, you know, and there, now, there, now there's, uh, there's Mike Todd uh, handling a different kind of axe than he, he yep. usually uh, plays up here on stage. But he was, was one of the guys that was there that day when we were trying to clear everything out and be able to even tell there was a house back there. So I uh, saw that picture in there. I thought that was a good one, a little, a, a new kind of axe for Mike. <laughs> oh, before we, go to the, before we go to drama, you guys have been here before, you know dramas, but um, I... I, wanna, I want to, uh, I, I forgot a little story I wanted to tell you, which is also important. Once we got the church up and running, and it, there was, Mike had a dream. And I just, I do want to touch on that dream just real quick. Because it was one of the things that inspired all of us, I think. And got us to help figure out what we were really doing. And so, uh, we had been, I think it was maybe about the time we switched to Sunday mornings. And we had to decide that we, what we needed to do. And we needed to, you know, we needed to leave our churches. That was when Sue and I had to leave the church that we had gone to, I had gone to my entire life. And I had relatives that were not happy and all that. But anyway, um, Mike had a dream. And he, he dreamed that we had started the service. And it started to rain. And thunder and lightning. And we were in the service. And, and it was this huge storm just rattling the windows. And so he, was, he, he, he imagined looking outside and there was all these people standing out in the rain. And he's thinking now as he preached, why, why are those people out there? They need to come in. You know, we're safe and warm in here. They need to come in. And so he, he, in his dream, he stopped the service and we all, all went out and we're looking through the windows and at the doors and we're calling for the people, come in, come in from the rain, come in from the rain. You know, you don't have to stand out there and get wet and, and be in the danger of the storm. You can come in here where it's safe and warm. And no one came. They were out there, but no one came. And here we were, and no one came. And so he said, he, he, he told everybody, you know what? The only way we're going to get people to come in is we have to get wet. We have to go out and get wet. It's the only way we can bring people in. And so we all ran out and brought people in. And that dream inspired us, I think, to take off in, in a new level because we have, and, and, and that holds true today. We can't just be here in our safe little warm place and expect people to just walk in the door if we're not willing to go out and get wet for Jesus. And so, uh, so that was one of the things that we did. And, and part, of that, part of that getting wet and part of that whole um, theme of, of being different than traditional church, that brings us then to... Um, a drama department. We had a drama. We had we had music and we 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 had long hair and we played rock and songs and all that. And we had a drama department. And I'm going to say, I mean, obviously I can't say it for absolutely sure, but I'm going to say that probably for 16 years we had a drama every week for 16 years. Um, Sue was the was the drama coach, and and we had a, we had a really nice big drama team. And these dramas were not just like wearing you know, the, your bathrobe and being a shepherd and reading. You know, these, these were professionally done dramas. I mean, they were amazing dramas. Every week, amazing professional dramas. And the reason we did those is because every week we did a drama that tied in with what Mike's going to talk about. And so we would bring this drama to people, and it would be poignant. Sometimes you would cry your, cry your eyes out. Sometimes you would laugh. Sometimes, you know, it, 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 it showed, uh, you know, uh, passages in the Bible, and all those kinds of things. There, well, now there's Larry. There's Larry as Fred Flintstone, and Chris Wirt right next to him. And then Jim Lance is here this morning, and he's Barney uh, down on the left side there. 
Um, <laughs> now, this was probably some kind of a family thing. It, was, it probably had something to do with family, and it, we used the Flintstones as the family. But you knew exactly what was going on when you saw these dramas. It was like, it was like wow, you know, and then Mike would come out and talk about it, you know, and it was, it was awesome. This is, this is one, I think we probably did a drama one, one Sunday because all the bands got their cowboy stuff on. And we brought this, I couldn't, I couldn't not do this one because Mike's out here actually hanging on to one of my guitars, I think. Mike couldn't play guitar. He had no idea what he was doing. But he actually was out here and people thought he was playing. And then at one point, Mike Todd, as I recall, slipped behind the curtain and Mike Overpeck went into a crazy lead, you know. He, he and Mike had like worked on it where to hold your fingers and stuff. And so... <clears throat> So Mike was like ripping this thing, and Mike, Mike over, and everybody after the service was like, "Oh my gosh, I didn't know you could play! Oh, why don't you be in the band every week? You were awesome!" You know, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> so I think that was the one and only time that Mike was ever in the band. But uh, man, it was worth it. It was fun. Uh, obviously, it must have been sometime around Christmassy time because I see a Christmas tree up there. But anyway, um, lots of great, lots of great memories from that. Um, the, there was one up there right before I think it was uh, Ponderosa. Uh, no, yeah, that one. That was, that was, the, uh, that was the, uh, um, the, the, the talents, the story of the talents in the Bible. And uh, well, Jim and Jody are both in that one too. And uh, Mike Wagaman's in there. And, and, but anyway, it was, it was set kind of on the Ponderosa, if you will, you know. And uh, it talked about, you know, the boys, one, one boy had 10. Actually, it wasn't talents, it was nuggets. One boy had 10 nuggets and he made 10 more out of that. One had five, made five more out of that. But they were actually nuggets and we used chicken McNuggets. And then Jim, again, who's here this morning, uh, was, was Archibald and he's the one that just was, was, was afraid that he was going to uh, not, he was going to lose his nugget. So when, when Ben, who's... God says, well, what did you do with your nugget? He says, well, I was just afraid that I would lose it, so I kept it. I got it right here under my hat, you know. And, uh, but anyway, it's a great way to tell that story and know exactly what the Bible means, you know. I mean, it was just, it was amazing. So anyway, we, had, we did dramas every, every week. You ready to be in the remake of that, Nate? Maybe, uh, okay. Jeremy? Jeremy? <laughs> Right there. <laughs> so, of course, uh, Luke mentioned it in announcements this morning that we have a baptism coming up here, but that was just as exciting and huge of a moment of lives transformed back then Absolutely. as well. And we were looking through pictures and captured a few of, of those as well over at Bethlehem. Yep. What we did for baptism, it's uh, probably the still same horse tank, <laughs> but... but uh, uh, but again, we couldn't do it really inside, and so we would usually do them in the spring and the summer. And uh, at Bethany, behind the school, there's a little courtyard out there, and so we would we would set up and we would have we would have worship and and church, and then we would come out in the courtyard and do baptism. And you see, there's our own Bobby Miller um, being baptized, and there's Connie Atkins. Um, so they've both been around for a while, but that was, it was, it was not the kind of thing that we do with the band playing and the celebration, but it was a pretty celebratory time. And it was, of course, you know, baptism was always my favorite time. Every time we do baptism, I, I get all weepy and it's awesome. So now you guys uh, went all out one time, did baptism a little bit different. Yes. And, uh, we decided to, oh wait, this wasn't baptism. Oh, okay. My, my bad. My bad. Yeah, again, you can see you can do whatever it takes. That's, again, my wife, uh, which is probably completely embarrassed right now. But, uh, you know, if you're part of the staff, you, uh, you do whatever you have to do. So this was at our 10-year anniversary, actually. Uh, we did a 10-year anniversary. We had a carnival, and we had all kinds of fun and food and dunk tanks and, and other kinds of games, and, you know, the band played. And so uh, that was from that. And I think this is... Now, those of you who know Mike... I think he just got out of the dunk tank, but those of you who know Mike... Uh, get the get the deal here. Uh, Mike was not a hooker, not. So uh, I mean, great guy, great guy, but he just he said, "I reserve my hugs for my wife, and that's it, <laughs> no more hugs." So uh, so anyway, uh, pro probably the most money, one of the most monies we ever made. I slipped in. We had our church auction, our tidal wave auction, like we do now. And uh, at the end of the at end of it, we were done, and everything was over. And all of a sudden, I had this idea, and I said, "Oh wait, we have one more thing. We have one more thing." We're going to auction off a hug from Mike. And we got, there, was, there was people bidding all over the place. And then there was a group of about 10 
that decided they were going to do this thing. And they got in, they spent a whole bunch of money and, and bought a hug from Mike. And so then it was great because, you know, he had to actually come up on stage one morning and actually give them all a hug. You know, I mean, they all lined up and he had to give them all a hug. And it was like, you know, probably his worst day ever. But, um, <laughs> but we all loved it, you know, we all loved it, yeah. And then, you know, as we did all kinds of things, that's Jeff Miller, that's Kevin's brother Jeff, and we did a, we did a, a one of, probably one of the best things we ever did as far as an outreach that was most successful uh, was a classic car show. And we had, uh, we had clowns and we had people and we had the classic cars come in. We had a bunch of them. Oh my gosh, we had some just beautiful cars. Uh, we had the uh, pink lady show up, I think, which is about like the next one. And... Um, uh, everybody dressed up in, in, you know, sock hop stuff and all that kind of thing. And we, we did, uh, the band got outside and did a concert and we were rocking like crazy out there. I mean, I mean, this, I think was after church, we did the classic car show. We're doing fifties and sixties and, you know, doobies and all kinds of stuff out there. Uh, doobie brothers, and eagles and that kind of stuff. And we were rocking out. Yeah, not, yeah, not, not the other kind of doobies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't get that far into the culture. <laughs> Glad you finished that sentence. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, that was fun, and we were, I mean, you, you could probably hear us all over Goshen, because we had it cranked up, you know, we were, we were, we were having some fun. So, I mean, we tried to, we tried to do a lot of uh, outreach events, we tried to do things that would get people interested in showing up, you know, and, and I think there's actually still people here that came to that. Um, that's a kind of special one for you too, Dar. Uh, but that, uh, there, there are people who showed up at that because they thought, oh, cool, car show. I'll go take my car, I'll look at some cool cars, and ended up like, wow, this place may not be totally stupid. So um, showed up on Sunday, you know, and then said, oh, really, it isn't. It is kind of cool. So we, we kept going. So, so anyway, yeah, that's, we tried to do a lot of things like that back in the early days. So, this was still uh, when we were Bethany. Who's this next guy? Oh, anybody recognize him? We did a, we did a, Mike did a message one morning, and it was, it was, and his message was called The Makeover. And uh, as all of us know, if we know Christ, is that, you know, we, we sometimes kind of mess up in our lives, and we need, sometimes we just need to do a makeover. We need to have that time where we can turn it around and do a makeover. And so, uh, so I think this was in place of the drama that Sunday. Tim Kilmer, our own Tim, came out, and you, you guys know Tim, and, and Tim was, I wish we would have got the picture of the front too, but you know he was pretty. I mean, he was pretty grungy. I'll have to see. Big, great, big, huge beard and the long ponytail, and so they brought him up and he talked to Tim about um, doing a makeover, and then and then he sent he sent Tim back in the wings, and Kelly Weigel, who was our resident um, makeup artist, uh, did a little makeover on Tim, and so when Mike got his message done and he talked about how we can be made over in Christ, then. <laughs> Look pretty good, huh? <laughs> but, you know, that, that object lesson is, was so important, you know, to let people know that, you know, you can be made over, you know, and, and Tim, Tim showed, it, showed that, uh, through that through that message, which was good. And that, that's the kind of things we try to do with the dramas, too. Yeah. So you had so many cool memories of that time there at Bethany, but at some point God put something on your heart and a group of people's heart here for something that was next. What was that all about? Yeah, like I said, we had 14 years at Bethany. So that means 14 years of getting equipment out and putting it back, you know, getting signs out and putting them back. And, and um, you know, you begin to get weary, although we were still going hard at it. But we started to have that dream. You know, God started to put that dream in our heart that maybe we could have our own place sometime. You know, maybe we could do that. So we, we started looking around. We looked at some factories. We looked at some uh, buildings. We looked, you know, we went around and looked at a variety of places and none of them just seemed to be right. Um, so we were getting, you know, like, okay, Lord, what, what's next? And Mike, um, told me, he called me one day, I think it was on a Monday. And he said, Hey, you know, they're going to be a land auction and uh, Kircher's Orchard is selling off some of their property and, and the land auction, but the land auction, he said, I didn't see it till now. Land auctions on Thursday. And he said, you know, it might be worth taking a look at. Well, from Monday to Thursday, you might think there's no Sundays in between there. So there's no place for us to actually talk to the church about it or anything. So, so I drove out by, and, and um, it looked like a really nice piece of property. Big rolling, you know, and a little bit of a hill, apple trees all over the place. And uh, so I called um, a few of my friends, 
and said, I think we ought to just show up at the auction, see what might happen, you know, and, and, and we talked about the fact that, you know, we can't really meet with the church, we can't talk to anybody about it, you know, or anything, we're just going to, but, but it's Thursday, I mean, you know, either we go or, or, it's, or it's gone, you know, so Greg Bernheisel was one of them, Greg's here this morning, and uh, Jack Rogers, and Dave Rayburn, I know Dave's here this morning, and um, uh, let's see, who else was there, Wagaman. Mike Wagaman, Mike Wagaman, yeah, so uh, we met, um, we met over at, well, Mike Overpeck is with us too, and we met at that Violet House that I had shown you a little bit ago, uh, a good hour or more before the, uh, the auction, and we said, we just prayed. I mean, we basically just sat in there and prayed. You know, God, you know, we don't know what we're doing. None of us had ever been to a land auction before, and we're like, we don't know what we're doing, but we're going to go, and, you know, whatever happens, happens. And so, uh, so we did. We prayed for an hour or so, and we went over there, and we sat in that auction, and it was weird. I mean, it was like, if you, some of you maybe been to land auctions, but, it, you, know, it, you know, there was lots of acres. We didn't need all of them, and people were trying to buy them individually, and, and it just, it was very, very, it's, I could go a long story, but it was very confusing. And so finally, we made a bid on 18, 18 and a quarter acres, I think it was. We just said, you know what, we're going to go for this. And, of course, we're like, well, what happens if the church doesn't want it? Like, I don't know, you know, I don't know. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to make a bid on it. So, so we got together, we decided we're going to do that. And so we made a bid for 18 acres. Well, unless the whole thing is in that package, it doesn't go. So it sat there for a long time. And we had been told by the auctioneer that there's two guys here that want the whole thing. And they're just going to sit around, they're going to wait to see what, what it goes for. And whenever it gets to the end, they're just going to make a bid a little bit above that and... They're going to take it. He said, I almost guarantee you this, you're not going to have an opportunity for this because they're going to, they're going to take it. And the, the, prop, the property value was decent, you know, so they're just going to, they're just going to see what the, what the going rate is, take it as low as they can, and get one or the other of them will take it. And so, uh, but we made our bid, and then um, a gentleman named Tim Martin uh, bid on everything else. So, that we, so he actually completed our package. So it, so it could actually go in as an actual bona fide bid. And uh, thank God for Tim. And so uh, we were, we kind of, that was like the last, one of the last bids, but it was, it was too low and they let it click off. And so uh, they got to the end and of course, Phil Hahn was the auctioneer and Phil was kind of expecting one of these two guys or both of them to start up in the bids because that's what they came for. Well, it didn't happen. So it got down and he said, okay, well, we're going to, you know, we actually set a clock and we're going to set the clock and we're going to count it down for two minutes. And if nobody else bids, it's your, you know, you win the bid. So, man, that was the longest two minutes in history. Because um, it kept clicking off, and we kept knowing these guys are going to bid. These guys are going to bid. They're going to, I mean, they're going to go, you know, 10,000 above us or whatever, you know. And uh, it clicked down, and it clicked down, and it clicked down. And it rang, and we had won the bid. And uh, so, but, it, but, but, and so we're like, uh, what happened? <laughs> uh, you realize we just bought like 18 acres of ground and we don't know if the church wants it or not. We have no idea whether the church wants it or not. But it also said this, the bid's too low. It's, it's below, it's below what uh, they said was their minimum bid. So uh, we had to wait around and they called and talked to the owners and went back and forth, back and forth. And, and uh, they came out and they said they, they will accept that offer. And so, uh, so we then had to come back to the church. We put together a letter. In fact, that letter is up here if anybody's interested. And the pen we signed it with. And uh, we came back to the church and had to say, um, well, here's what's happened. <laughs> <laughs> a few of us got together and bought some property. We thought it'd be really cool for the church. And if you guys are interested, you can buy it from us. <laughs> <laughs> and if not, then we'll do something else with it. So, uh, so that's what we did. And then people got on board and decided that was pretty cool. And, and uh, so we had... We did, we did go through then, and we decided we're going to pay for the, for the ground before we started the building process. So that's what we, uh, we, that was the next level, is going through, you know, paying for, the, mm -hmm. paying for this property. And there it is, right there, um, the way it looked when we, when we purchased it. And uh, we, got to, we got to working on getting it paid for and, and dreaming of a new home. <laughs> and then it was time to get started. It was. After we started. got it paid for it, we decided it was time to start. And so we started on the building. And, of course, we had a lot of, a lot of uh, organizing and, and working. And we got the sign out. We, we're pretty good at building si temporary signs. <laughs> um, we do a lot of those temporary signs. And you didn't have around. to haul this one back and forth every day. We did not have to haul this. Yeah, we actually, this is our ground, so we could plan it. 
there we got we uh, we got a, a architect involved and started doing some pictures and some and and, and oh this is yeah, this is a great thing too. Jesse Craver was a was a gentleman that went to our church at that time. And Jesse owned a big excavating company, and uh, so this is this is kind of amazing. We decided we we're going to do this, and um, you know every church hopefully builds camaraderie, which we're going to talk about, and, and, and does a lot of things where, they, where the people get together and volunteer and do a lot of things. But I don't know of any church or other building, for that matter, that ever had completely volunteer excavating. <laughs> our excavating of this church was done by our own people, volunteer. And Jesse uh, just brought some, some stuff that he had in his big excavating company that he didn't use anymore. They were, he had a few pieces that were, they were off, and he didn't use them. He had retired them. He brought them out here. Set them out, and our guys just came and just kept working at it. And so uh, I don't want to miss it. If, if you're on excavating, why don't you stand up? Any of you guys that were here to excavate? I know Woggy was, but. <laughs> yeah, and Scott. Scott helped out. Um, Brett Troger, Brett Troger, Steve Weigel. Um, well, there's Brett right there. There's Brett and Mike and Glenn. Um, Glenn Yoder was, was part of that crew, too. Steve mm -hmm. Wilson. I mean, we just had a bunch of guys that knew how to run heavy equipment, and they actually excavated the building, which was <laughs> kind of amazing. Uh, but anyway, that's where we started, and they got, they got cooking on it. And then uh, uh, once we had decided, you know, the, the plan and everything, and we, we excavated and then uh, uh, moved on to, well, building. And then you guys took some time to have a special church family get-together to pray over this. Oh, we did. We did. Yes. Yes. We had a, uh, a, a prayer blessing. We all met out right when we were, when the excavating was started going on and everything. We, we met and we, uh, we prayed for the building. We prayed for the situation. We prayed for everybody working on there. And then as we completed that, people actually had filled out prayer cards and they, they came up and at the end of the, of the ceremony here, they dropped their prayers into this bucket. And these were all prayers for the church, all prayers for the building, all prayers for things um, that are be going on in the future here. And not only just for the building, but for, the, for you know, this, this place to be a light to Jesus Christ and to continue. And that was the foundation prayers. And then we gathered all those and distributed those into the trench uh, and actually poured the con this This building literally sets on the prayers of the people. Um, and I think that next one should show that. But uh, yeah, here you can see all the, all the prayers distributed in there through the trench, and they went all around. And then uh, and each one of them was dropped in. I, I think the next picture shows a, you know, an actual uh, prayer that was put in there. That CCW would be a light on a hill. And, uh, and then they, it was actually all the concrete was poured in on top of those. And so this entire building sets on the, I think the next one shows the, being, yep, poured in there and set on there. So we are setting on the prayers of the people, um, which I thought was a very cool, very cool thing that, that went on. Then more concrete was poured, and uh, we went ahead and started getting, getting a building, I mean, getting the beginnings of it. So these are, these are just pictures here of, of when we started and got things rolling and um, got ready. There's the basement. There's treasure land. It looks a little different now. Um, but um, it was a fun time. This, now, now, once the excavating was done, then of course concrete was pretty much done by others. And then here's the here's the structure starting to go up, and we uh, we were of course excited as we got to see that go up, and we didn't really you know, mess around too much with putting the steel up, because um, because these guys were doing this, so and that's up at the very top. You need fan there, Becky? <laughs> <laughs> was it the Oh, was it the height thing that you were? Okay, I thought maybe something no, we else did. that you were. Yeah, but this, now this is what these guys were doing, obviously, up at the top of this thing, you know. But uh, Damn, Becky. We, we felt like we needed to help, too. We felt oh. like we needed to help, too, right? <laughs> I love this as we went through the pictures of all these guys working and everything, and then I found what the rest of our guys were, were doing during that time. Uh, <laughs> That was. Uh, Trust me, when that guy that was, was up on top of that beam, yeah. we were watching. <laughs> now, this is where camaraderie started to come together. They got this thing up, and we, we again, the excavating was done, and then we called, we called the guys in and said, okay, it's ready. 
this half of the roof is ready to go. And these guys showed up. And um, essentially, in one day, um, we got that roof on. I mean, you can see there's just guys all over the place. We, we've got guys that showed up. We have done that from the word go as people are willing to come, willing to be a part, and willing to get going. And so um, the roofing went on. Well, and there's, there's uh, Lee Borntrager. We got to give him a lot of credit, too, considering Lee owns a roofing company. He was very helpful um, in helping the rest of us that don't do it every day. Um, but, uh, oh, well, of course, as is the tradition with the community church of Waterford. We also eat a lot, and so we got that done also. But there's, there's a day um, of finishing things up. When you got a bunch of guys that are, you know a little bit about what they're doing and they're willing to go for it, they go for it. And then you notice, wait, go back there. I think maybe it showed. Oh, yeah, you can see over here it's still, still, still on this side. It's still just the, the beams. So then we had to call the guys back for another day when we worked on the other half, and they got that ready. So we had a bunch of guys show up again all over the roof, laying the shingles down, getting that end of the building done, and um, we got to the end of the day. Well, oh, and we ate. Uh, we ate, and, and uh, there's day two when we finished up that end of the building. Um, and then we had, a, we had an open house uh, at one point just to let people see, well, that's what you're looking at right here um, before, the, you know, that's the stage, and you see in underneath. There's actually a lot of storage under the stage. You can kind of see some, some of it right there. And there's, oh, there's guys. Yeah. And, then, and then again, as we, as we continued to work in the building, the amount of time that was spent um, here was amazing because we've done a lot. <laughs> Quick story on this. Um, now, this is not part of that, but, but uh, when, when we got to the end, um, the ceiling's all blacked out, and uh, all the piping and stuff up there was, was galvanized or whatever. I mean, you could, see, you could see that. So as I recall, it was Justin and Dave Rayburn. We had this big lift, and we sent them up there with black spray paint, and they sprayed all the pipes and everything, so you just you know, blacked out up there. And so they got up, when they got up there at the beginning, you know, they're up on this, I mean, they're up that high. That's way up there, and they're up on this lift, and this thing, of course, it's just like swaying, you know. And so these guys are like standing in the middle, and shh, 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 you know. But they're up there. And they're using aerosol cans of black paint. And after about a half hour or 45 minutes or something, they're like, hey, you guys, hey, hey, look, at hey look at this. Here, hold my ankle. I think I can get this one. So finally we're like, okay, these guys, I got to come down. So, so they came down and they were like completely covered, you know, completely covered with black, you know, and giggling. Oh my gosh, they're giggling and just having the best time. And I'm like, okay, it's, it is definitely time to get these guys back to reality. All right, so we go from doobies to aerosol. Yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> well, see, yeah. Okay, I was wondering. The, the first one was okay. the Doobie Brothers. This one was like, yeah, they were really giggling and stuff, yeah. <laughs> And so we had, we had gobs and gobs of, of help. I, we, we think we had, uh, we tried to put it together, and I think we're actually a little bit low. Um, we tried to kind of put together, because we, we painted, we roofed, we, uh, we did all the cabinetry throughout the, the, house, the, the uh, building. We did painting. Uh, actually, Miriam and, and Tina, were, if, you see, if you see all the murals through the building, um, they were very instrumental in that. Those were all done by our people, you know, all the stuff you see out in the different places, the murals and uh, did a fantastic job. And so they, um, they, were, they were very instrumental and they had people help them with that. But uh, we figured there was at least, while we built this, just the, for the building of the building, there was at least 10,000 hours of volunteer help uh, to put this together. And I think that's probably low because I think there's a few people that had 1,000 by themselves. So uh, 10,000 might be a little bit low, but, uh, <laughs> but the, the amount of time that people spent was phenomenal. and, and uh, such camaraderie was built through that. Such a, such a, such a time of, of ownership and, and love for each other and, and being together. And it was, it, was, it was great. So then this building was ready for services and it was time to say goodbye to a, the place that you'd been for quite a while. It was. We, we got it ready and it was a little bittersweet because, I mean, uh, Bethany had been home uh, for 14 years. And so... Uh, we, had a, we had a farewell kind of a service, and we went in, and we sat around in the, uh, in the auditorium in there, and uh, you can see Mike there kind of in the middle, and we, again, prayed and said goodbye uh, to our home that we'd had there for 14 years, and, uh, and then we left. Um, 
And we still, at this point, we still had a lot of things in there. I didn't, we didn't get any pictures of that. But that day, um, we had a bunch of people that came and had their pickup trucks and, and other kind of trucks and trailers, and we moved everything out. By that time, Bethany had actually let us keep some things there. It wasn't like in the very beginning. So we had moved all of our decorations, all of our signs, everything. We moved out that day and, and put them in pickup trucks. And then there was a picture I should have put in there. It was a picture of Kathleen switching off the light for the last time. It's kind of a kind of a sad little thing where she switched off the light and we darkened it and that was, we walked away. And then every, everybody brought all those truckloads of stuff and we came out to the new church and uh, started putting them all away and we are to where we are today. It looks pretty much like it does today. So uh, uh, the other bittersweet thing that happened after the church was built is that, and I guess that's a, it's pretty, fairly typical, um, is that our pastor of 18 years who had uh, given everything, everything in his family to this church, um, kind of succumbed to burnout, I guess you might say. And he decided it was time for him to mo move on. And, and, it, and uh, I guess that is very typical when you have a pastor that goes through a major, major building project. That it, uh, Sometimes that's... Uh, so, I mean, he was with us for a while. But, um, but he decided it was time to move on. And so... Uh, we will always love Mike and Tara. We will always uh, have the greatest respect for them because they brought us to this point. Um, and um, it, it's, it's, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience uh, with them. And, and the, the, to see them just give it all, give it all. But then, uh, then we got this guy. And so. Sorry. <laughs> And man, does Reed miss Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and actually, there's a, really, there's a really great story that goes with, uh, with us uh, finding this guy, too. But that, that's, for, that's for another time. We'll do that next week. Yeah, yeah. next week. How we do how we talk about the present next yep. week? Mike, you know, he, he, would be, he would be so. part of the present time. Yep. So, so anyway, um, yeah. that's, uh, that's kind of where we came from. Like I said, there's tons of stories I could still tell. But that's, uh, it gives you a little bit. And I like a lot of you maybe seeing some things for the first time. So... Uh, part of where we came from, and it's just important to us to continue to shine the light of Jesus Christ. Um, it really, none of that makes any difference if we aren't reaching people for Christ, and that's, that's who we are, that's what we're about, and that's what we want to continue to be about. Uh, every week, uh, find those people who are seeking and find a place for them to come and be able to praise God and worship and get to know him better. So um, I think... Well. It's quite appropriate that you're leading us in this final song because you've told us a lot of history today, but I know you believe with all your heart and soul and mind that our best days are still ahead of us. So why don't we go ahead and give some love for Reed for all that sharing there. And... <clears throat> want that to be our prayer, don't we? That our best days are ahead of us, our best efforts, our best energy, our best passion to do the things that God has called us to do. As Reed mentioned earlier, when we get together, we like to eat. So there is birthday cake that's going to be on the way out. So make sure you grab a piece or two or five. Uh, so don't let my little nine-year-old get one though. She's been asking for five pieces all morning already. So don't, don't let her do that. So, uh, but let's go ahead and, and close in a word of prayer. God, we are grateful for the chance that we have had this morning to come together as your church family, to be able to celebrate what you have done. You are a great and awesome and big, big God with such an amazing upper story. And we are so grateful for how you have allowed us to be a part of this story in particular. And for those like Reed who have been here since the get-go and have been around since the, the vision was birthed and for how you moved in Mike's heart and the other pastor's hearts and other people to come alongside and form this group that, that started this dream that you put on their hearts. Everybody who is here today has been blessed because of their obedience. So we thank you for that, Lord. And Lord, we know that just like today, as Reed shared stories of what they hoped it would be for, what that would be like when they got started, they would have never been able to dream some of the stories that we could tell today, 25 years later. And God, that's the same thing that we want. We want our best days to be ahead of us. So that in another 25 years, when this church family is celebrating their 50th anniversary, there are going to be even more amazing stories of how you showed up in people's lives and did those things that only you can do. 
So thank you for the chance we had today to spend some time remembering and reflecting on your goodness. We look forward to the next two weeks as we look at where we are and where we're going, God. We just pray that you continue to show up and do your thing. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's family said, amen. amen. Go get some cake. Nate, no pushing. All right? No pushing. <laughs> Love you guys. We'll see you next week.